Okay, we want to talk about one more type of reaction, and that is the redox reaction. Redox reactions are something new, so we want to spend a few minutes on this sort of separate from other things. Let's look at our enduring understanding. It says that a substance can change into another substance through different processes, and the change itself can be identified by the sort of process that produces it. So we need to be able to identify those types of processes. There are three types of reactions that College Board might ask you to identify, and those are acid-base, we'll get to those in another unit, oxidation reduction, that's what we're calling redox, and then precipitation reactions. Precipitation reactions are the ones we were writing net ionics for. Those are double replacements that have a precipitate form. So you already know how to identify those. We'll look at redox today and acid base we've looked at in previous chemistry classes, but we'll circle back to them in a later unit. So we also have three pieces of knowledge. The first piece of knowledge is about that acid base reaction. So we'll sort of put a star by this to remind us to come back to that when we are in that acid base unit. The second piece of knowledge says that a redox reaction involves the transfer of electrons between chemical species and that is indicated by a change in oxidation number. It also reminds us that combustion is a type of redox reaction and it gives us an example. The third little piece of knowledge is that in a redox reaction, electrons are transferred from the species that is oxidized to the species that is reduced. So let's sort of get into defining some of those terms and understand what they mean by oxidation, reduction, oxidation numbers, all of those things. All right, oxidation is a process by which a species loses electrons. So oxidation, we want to connect with losing electrons. When we say species, we don't mean biological, of course. We mean any kind of chemical substance. So this could be an atom, or it could be some sort of compound, or it could be an ion, kind of anything. But it's going to lose electrons. So here's an example where we have an atom. It loses an electron, so it becomes a positive ion, and then there's that little electron off to the side in the products because it has separated out from the sodium atom it was originally attached to. Reduction is that opposite process. Reduction is the process by which a species gains electrons. So reduction, we want to connect with gaining electrons. Here's an example of that. We've got a chlorine atom and it's gaining an electron to become a chlorine anion. That's a little negative sign right there. Notice that in reduction, our charge went from basically no charge, zero, to negative. So our charge reduced. So it's easy to remember reduction reduces the charge, and then oxidation would be the opposite one. There are also a couple of mnemonics to help us um, remember this. My favorite of them is Leo says, Gur and Leo would be like a lion, like growling. So Leo says Gur, that reminds us that loss of electrons is oxidation and that gain of electrons is reduction. There's another that some people use and that is oil rig. So if you've already learned that, you're welcome to keep it. This one stands for oxidation is loss. I like to add of electrons, otherwise sometimes this can be a little bit confusing. And then the rig part is reduction is gain. Again, I like to add of electrons, otherwise we can get a little bit confused. Oxidation and reduction always happen together. If something is oxidized, something else is reduced. So often we see the reaction written like this. There is still an oxidation part and a reduction part, but it's not as obvious in that equation. If we separate out the sodium part and the chloride part, then we get those two reactions above. We've got sodium atoms transforming into sodium ions that have a plus one charge. How did that happen? Well, they lost an electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, went from a chlorine atom to a chlorine anion. It, it gained an electron to reduce that charge. Where did this electron come from and where did this electron go? Well, these two are the same electrons. This electron left sodium and attached itself to chlorine. And that's always the case. Whenever something's oxidized, something else is reduced and the electrons that are removed during oxidation are gained during reduction.
All right, our pieces of knowledge mentioned oxidation numbers. So we need to understand what those are. Oxidation numbers are just numbers that help us see oxidation and reduction if the two parts of the equation, if the two half reactions are not written out separately like this. So they're numbers that we can assign, sort of like charges, that help us see if an atom has gained or lost electrons. There are some rules to follow. The first one is that any element that's not bonded, any unbonded element is going to have an oxidation number of zero. This includes any diatomic elements. So if we have something like H2 plus O2, the oxidation number on H and on O is zero. If we have something like magnesium chloride plus uh, lithium, the lithium's oxidation number is zero because that's just an element. The rest of these rules refer to bonded elements. If fluorine is bonded to something else, its oxidation is always negative one, and there's no exception to that rule. If oxygen is bonded to something, it's usually negative one. If oxygen is bonded to something, its oxidation number is usually negative two, the only exception being if it's fluorine. Remember that this rule right here, this fluoride rule, there is no exception to. So if oxygen and fluorine are both bonded together, that fluorine has to have the negative one, even if that means oxygen does not have a negative two. If we're talking about ionic compounds, the monatomic ions get the charge that their ions would have. And when we look at a compound as a whole or a polyatomic ion as a whole, and we add up all of the oxidation numbers of all of the atoms that make up that substance, they have to add up to whatever the overall charge is. So in other words, this example right here, magnesium fluoride, magnesium fluoride is a neutral compound. So when we add up these oxidation numbers, they need to add up to zero. If we have a polyatomic ion like this, when we add up all of those oxidation numbers, they need to add up to negative one. So let's try that with these two examples. Here's magnesium fluoride. So let's try this magnesium fluoride. Let's actually assign oxidation numbers. Neither of these are unbonded, so that first rule doesn't apply. The second rule tells us that fluorine is always a negative one. So that's easy. Fluorine is a negative one. Magnesium is a part of an ionic compound, and it's a monatomic ion. So it's an ion that's just on the periodic table, a single atom, not polyatomic, and it's part of an ionic compound. So it's going to get the oxidation number equal to the charge of the ion. Magnesium makes a plus two charge. Now let's make sure that our last rule is followed. When we add all of these up, does it equal zero? Well, magnesium was a plus two, and there's only one of it. Plus fluoride was a negative one, and there are two of them. So positive two plus negative two does in fact equal zero. So those are my oxidation numbers. Magnesium has an oxidation number of plus two and fluoride has an oxidation number of negative one. Let's do this for this NO3, this nitrate ion. There are no elements unbonded. There's no fluorine. So the next rule we get to is that oxygen is usually a negative two. So a negative two on that oxygen. That means each of those oxygens has a negative two. So we don't know what the nitrogen is yet. Nitrogen will just let be represented by an X, but we know that there are three negative twos and that when we add all of this up together, it needs to add up to negative one. Our other rules of it being in an ionic compound, that does not help because nitrate is not an ionic compound. It is an ion, but as it sits here, it's not part of a compound. So we just need to make sure that nitrogen plus oxygen plus oxygen plus oxygen, nitrogen plus our three oxygens equals negative one. So some number that is the nitrogen oxidation number plus negative six has to equal negative one. So it looks like our X is positive five. Positive five plus negative six would give us negative one. So the oxidation number on our nitrogen then is positive five. Five. Let's look at some of these other examples. Let's look at water. Again, there's no unbonded atom. There's no fluorine. 
but there is an oxygen. So we're going to let that oxygen have a negative two oxidation number. Hydrogen, let's figure out. We know there are two hydrogens and they're going to have the same oxidation number because this, they're the same element. And they're going to be added to negative two from oxygen. And overall, we know water is neutral, so they need to add up to zero. So then 2x needs to be equal to, oops, positive 2, so x equals positive 1. So our hydrogen would have a positive 1. Each hydrogen would be positive 1, and we're going to write it like that. We're going to say hydrogen atoms, each one is a positive 1. Oxygen, each one is a negative 2. Let's look at iron 2 carbonate. You do kind of need to know that this carbonate has a negative 2 charge. So knowing that, that means that the iron ion must have a positive two charge. That's why there's one iron per carbonate. So our iron ion would have a positive two charge. Our carbon we'll have to figure out in a minute, but our oxygen we know is going to be negative two because it always is. And overall, that whole compound is neutral. So our iron plus two plus our carbon, which we don't know, plus three negative twos from the oxygen need to add up to zero. So positive two plus X minus six, three times negative two. So X minus four equals zero. So our carbon must be positive four. Our next example is H2 and that follows one of our rules perfectly because this is an element. It's a diatomic element, but it's still an element, which means that its oxidation number is zero. The only way for hydrogen plus hydrogen to equal zero is if they're both zero. In this compound, we have a potassium, we have a chlorine, and we have an oxygen. We know that oxygen is always negative two and that this is an ionic compound. This potassium right here is a metal, and whenever we see a metal bonded to nonmetals, we know it's an ionic compound. If it's an ionic compound, then that metal is going to get the same oxidation number as the ion's charge. So that would be a positive one. So now we'll figure out what that chlorine should be. We have one potassium plus, we don't know what chlorine is, plus four negative twos on that oxygen. And this has no charge overall, so it should equal zero. So our chlorine needs a positive seven charge. All right, last little example for these. We just have a phosphorus and an oxygen, but notice this is a polyatomic ion with a negative three charge. So when we add this up, it needs to equal negative three. We know that the oxygens are gonna have a negative two. So some number for that phosphorus plus four times negative two needs to add up to negative three. So X minus eight needs to be negative three, which means that my X is positive five. So my phosphorus should be plus five. Let's apply this to some reactions. Let's look at these reactions and decide what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. Let's remind ourselves of something. Leo, so that's loss of electrons. Let's remind ourselves of what oxidation and reduction are. Remember Leo, so loss of electrons is oxidation says grr. So gain of electrons is reduction. Remember also that reduction is going to reduce the charge. So both of those can be helpful. Let's look at this first example. We have 10 and then on the product side we have a positive 10 ion. So that to go from 10 neutral to 10 positive we must have lost electrons. So the 10 is being oxidized. Also, the charge went up, so it couldn't be reduced. The nitrogen is going from plus 5 to plus 4. That charge is reduced because it gained electrons. So overall, that nitrogen is 
reduced. Let's look at the next example. We have mercury plus two going to mercury element. So it's going from plus two to zero. That's a reduction in charge, which means it had to gain electrons. So this mercury is being reduced. The iron is going from a zero oxidation state to a plus three. That means it lost electrons because it got more positive. So it was oxidized. In our next example, we're going to have to assign lots of oxidation numbers. So let's start there and then we'll see if anything changed. When I see something like this first reactant, one way to think about it is to think about PO4, this polyatomic ion, and do those oxidation numbers separately. So I know that PO4 has a negative three charge overall. So I know I'm gonna have negative twos coming from that oxygen, and there are four of them, plus whatever that P is, and that that should equal negative three. So negative eight plus whatever P is should be negative three. So that P is going to have to be plus five. So my oxygen here is negative two. My phosphorus here is positive five. And my hydrogen here, I'll have to figure out if this whole PO4 is negative three. Plus I have three hydrogens and all of that needs to add up to zero then my hydrogens must each be plus one. Let's look at that calcium hydroxide. Again, this is a ionic compound. So I can kind of figure out that metal is going to be a plus two. The oxygen is going to be a negative two, and then I can think about that hydrogen. So if calcium is plus two, plus I have two negative twos from oxygen, plus I have two hydrogens, whatever that hydrogen is, and it needs to all add up to zero. So two minus four plus two H's equals zero. So negative two plus two H equals zero, two H equals two. So my hydrogen must be a plus one. Okay, I'm gonna erase a bit so that I have more room so I can work this again. All right, let's look at calcium phosphate. I know my calcium is going to be a plus two because that's the charge on a calcium ion and this is an ionic compound. I know my oxygen is going to be a negative two because it always is unless it's bonded to fluorine. So now I can solve for that phosphorus. Three calciums that are negative two Plus I have two phosphorus, we'll just call that X. And I've got four times two is eight oxygens, which are negative two. So negative six plus two X plus six, negative 16, sorry, equals zero. So two X minus 10 equals zero, two X equals 10. So my X phosphorus must be positive five. Water we've already done, but we can do it again. We've got H2O. So we've just really got hydrogen and oxygen. We know the oxygen is going to be negative two and we've got two hydrogens. So that one's going to be positive one and positive one. Now let's look and see if there's any difference in the oxidation states for any of these um, elements. Hydrogen is plus one on in both places it appears in the reactants, and it is also plus one in the products. So that didn't change oxidation states. Let's look at phosphorus. Phosphorus is plus five on both sides. No change in oxidation states. Oxygen is negative two and negative two everywhere, no change. Calcium is plus two and negative two, so no change. So this one is not redox because we do not have any change in oxidation states. In fact, double replacement reactions are never 
redox reactions because we never have this happen. But you have to be able to prove it with oxidation states. You cannot just say, oh, it's double replacement reaction, so it's not going to be a redox reaction. You have to be able to prove it by showing that there's no change in your oxidation numbers.